Hello, I'm Susan Crumdike, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, and you have found the Transition Engineering Podcast, where we talk about how to make the energy transition work. Hello, welcome again to the Transition Engineering Podcast. And this is actually our last podcast from Munich. We're going to be broadcasting from, um, from Christchurch, New Zealand after this. Um, and I'm here with, uh, with Berlin and Philip as we have been um, for a while. And we're, I'm gonna interview them today. That's the shape of our podcast. Okay. Um, they have been taking a course on transition engineering. Um, this is the 14th week, the last week of classes. And we've been studying through the transition engineering textbook and, and learning lots of things. So um, for our podcast today, we're, I'm gonna to be interviewing the students. All right. Sound good? Yep. Ready? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, all right. One of the first things that we need to come to grips with is that uh, as a society, we're telling ourselves a lot of stories. And we have this story of sustainable development, that that's what we're going to do. Um, and so we, we really explored a lot about the idea of sustainable development and sustainability. So a uh, question I have for you. It's a fundamental question because are humans capable of sustainability? That's, that's sort of question number one. Is it in our nature to, to be sustainable or are we self-destructive? So question, um, have there ever been any or do you know of any sustainable societies? And let's put air quotes on that. Um, Berlin. Okay, so from my point of view, Sweden is the, well, not from my point of view, actually, Sweden is called like the most sustainable country nowadays. And yeah, for sure it is, or it tries to be, like they combine their high quality lifestyle with not harming the um, planet. Like they try to do it, like through a lot of sustainable, or what they call like sustainable ways, but once again, it's again the problem of what we call sustainable. And yeah, is sustainable lifestyle really like... Right. So they have the intention of being sustainable. Yeah. Right? Aren't they going to like outlaw petrol cars or something at some mm. point? And they're going to be 100% renewable electricity. They've really set some serious targets yeah. around sustainability. Good well, old Sweden. Yeah. Not only Sweden. Like Yeah. The other love, Scandinavians. Love, they try, but... <laughs> right. Well, they have the intention. They let's, have the let's intention. Let's give them that. Yeah. So as far as is there a sustainable society, well, we definitely have um, a modern society or two there with the intention to be sustainable. So, Philip, uh, I actually asked... Uh, these are sort of results of research, research questions. So, yeah. Philip, uh, how about your sustainable society? Who did you find? Um, I did not find uh, a modern society, but I searched on the internet and I think I found a historical one and they are also around right now but not that not in that uh, yeah dimension they were so the Native Americans are I believe or were very sustainable because they practiced a lot of um, sustainable um, techniques for example with with farming they have uh, sophisticated methods for permaculture, um, hunting. They used every part of the hunted animal, and not only for food, but the bones, for example, for um, for 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 what do you call it? Tools for tools. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I think the the fundamental thinking of the Native Americans was. Um, give back what you take yeah kind of balance yeah we definitely have that and um probably i would agree with you you know if if the europeans hadn't uh found america probably yeah. 
um, you'd see those cultures still going, doing what they wanted to do. Yeah, right. Um, and one of the things really that you do notice about the Native Americans and other indigenous people, we'd have to call them, is that they understand the constraints that in, in which right. they're right. They, living their lives. If there was no, were no buffaloes around, they had to manage their food otherwise. <laughs> Um, so it's like uh, no meat for the week or um, we have to look out for other solutions right. like plants or fish or they they had this balance and they had the restraints so it would be really interesting to study their management systems um, their the way they used resources that sort of thing I think yeah, yeah. I agree with you um, and the Europeans could have learned a lot of from them <laughs> Do true. Um, so the w that led us to another little question. Um, there are some remaining indigenous people, yep. um, the Australian Aborigines, uh, um, people in the Pacific, people who are living more traditional ways. Uh, they have traditional economies. Um, I do research in, in the area of sustainable development of these people. So I, I've worked in Amazon and in Amazonia. Um, and so the question is, <clears throat> uh, we've got this desire to, for sustainable development, right? We, we want people lifted out of poverty. We want, want people to have electricity and modern things. Um, but if they actually are now sustainable, um, exactly whose view of sustainable development should we be using? <laughs> Yeah, because we've developed and we're not sustainable. True. Um, yeah. And we think or the way of development is like the only way <laughs> things can work. But yeah, it's a, it's a pretty narrow point of view. And I think the people that lived on islands, for example, or indigenous people, they live their lifestyle and traditions like 2000 years ago and they they aren't poor so they are only poor the way we see it so because they have no uh, big house or money or whatever but they get it going for them and um, they did they always did so why would you force them to do a electrification or a modern transportation system Right. So if anything, um, I'm pretty sure that their traditional economies can't afford our developed things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if anything, maybe we, we should be trying to learn from them about um, how they how they view technology and how they view um, and how they manage things. I, I, I'm really interested in that. How um, what are the management systems that are in place uh before fossil fuels. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because fossil fuels is such a freebie, such a giant free um, all you can eat smorgasbord, really. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to manage too much there. You yeah. just have to just have to consume. Yes. Uh, right. Um, <clears throat> which leads us to the next question is, is it actually the fossil fuel? that we use and therefore all of the engineering around using all that energy, is it actually the fossil fuel that is the root of unsustainability? Um, we asked about, or have there been other sustainable societies? Well, have there been other unsustainable societies? So, well, from my point of view, like not being sustainable means like not using your resources, like using your resources in a way that you dam you make more damage than what there was in like before. So, for example, Mesopotamia had a big problem with deforestation because the because of their huge agricultural development, then they ran out of forests, and because of their irrigation and their huge a irrigation system they used them um, water f their salty water to um, yeah to make the irrigation right. system and therefore yeah 
uh, cause salination of their soils yet. <clears throat> okay, so Mesopotamia is uh, um, definitely, there's still people living there, but the environment's way different than it was back then. Yeah. And we know there were collapses throughout that area um, in the 1100s BC. Mm. Um, there were he really high civilizations that all sort of fell over. Um, <clears throat> Philip, what's uh, what's your example? Did you find a, a culture before fossil fuel that uh, <laughs> that wasn't sustainable? Yeah, I found um, the people of the Easter Islands, the Rapa Nui. They originally had a lot of uh, palm trees and they they lived on an island so um they had a lot of fish and yeah that they, they got it going for them but um they started chopping down their their palm trees to transport their big um statues big stone statues um and they made so much of them that they needed so much palm trees that they ultimately ran out of palm trees <laughs> which led to yeah the the soil of the ground was washed away by 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 the by the rain so they had to starve and they couldn't make canoes out of the palm trees because there were no palm trees anymore so they had to stay on this island and yeah this led to hunger and ultimately to cannibalism right. <laughs> so if that's not a a, a, a society that collapsed, <laughs> what would be another society? Well, I'll tell you, Easter Island is, uh, I, I agree with that one. That's a really good, um, what would you call it, uh, symbol for us. Yeah. Because they were on an island, they, their constraints should have been obvious to them. Yeah. And yeah. You, you just really have to wonder, here you are on a not really a very big island. And you don't notice that you're cutting down the trees that you depend on for food and shelter mm -hmm. and fuel and right. And mm -hmm. maybe you don't notice because what you're doing, what you're focused on, what you're talking about, what you think is the big project that you need to do is something stupid. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> making something that is not productive. It doesn't produce any food. It doesn't produce it. I'm sure it was producing some sort of prestige or wealth or something at the time there was some reason they were building all those stone yeah, statues of course yeah. <laughs> but but it ultimately that was what they did they destroyed themselves because of an idea of, of what they thought they were after they were wrong yeah yeah so so they're a really good example of that um that <clears throat> It's possible the Mesopotamians really didn't see that they were doing that, even though I have seen um, recordings from a couple thousand years ago. The Greek philosophers were, were saying, look, it, it, it's not a good idea to cut down all the trees. This <laughs> yeah. is going to be a disaster. Yeah. So people, there are some, the, the scientists who are observing what's going on and saying we shouldn't do this. Um, but it was to grow food and, and to use that resource as opposed to the Easter Islanders, which is it was to do something really dumb. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so two good lessons for us out of studying um, history yeah. of uh, <clears throat> sustainability or otherwise. So, so far, we don't think that human nature dooms us to boom and bust and, and crash and burn. If, you know, we're hopefully we're not a bacteria type of, of creature. We, we can observe ourselves. We can be self-reflective. And in a lot of cases, we can find that balance between how we use, um, how we interact with the environment around us and, um, and how we stay within constraints. Now, uh, people will point out right away, everyone who's listening to this is thinking, yeah, but the Native Americans didn't have very big populations. Mm. And they were in a vast wilderness of resources. Yeah. Yeah. They had so much more than they needed. Yeah, yeah but they didn't use it all up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And people might also point out that, um, you know, that, that maybe Mesopotamia or what was our other, no, our, our, our other sustainable society, um, Sweden. Sweden. 
again, a really low population with lots of resources. Mm. Yeah. So what about population? Does, you know, is that what dooms us to being unsustainable? Um, I think we'll, we might be able to put the lie to that sort of thing. The Native Americans, it seems like they had low population because um, they succumbed to the diseases that the Americans brought. There actually were a lot more of them there. Yeah. Um, the same thing happened, say, in New Zealand when the Europeans came. Um, that they actually about ninety percent population decline of the native people. It, the, those diseases are really effective at wow. clearing out the native people. Wow. <laughs> so it's uh, it, there were some um, actually some of the biggest uh, pyramids ever built were in um, the Mississippi Valley. The Native Americans, there, there really were quite a few of them. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, they hadn't overpopulated. I think we'd have to have to agree on that. But it does make you wonder, um, uh, does population doom us? I think, I don't know. Let's look at Asia. Let's look at, let's look at Japan and China, uh, India. There are actually pretty populous places that um, um, had, a, had a pretty long run at doing things yeah, in that, a way that kept going. That's true, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. some pretty high population densities there. Yeah. All right, which leads us to the next question. Okay, survival. Um, you either do or you don't, right? You, you either make those mistakes and bring about your own demise, or you don't. Um, so if, we, if we're going to look at survival engineering, so to speak, what... Um, as engineers, as the people who are, okay, pretty much responsible for technology change, but also for, for making things work, um, our role in making sure that, that survival works, um, I've proposed that we have those fields and they're not actually that old in, in, in the sense of, of engineering, um, and that safety engineering was probably the first one that a hundred years ago, the successes of engineering were really killing a lot of people. Mm. The factories yeah. people worked in, the mines, the, the transport systems they used, the manufactured goods, um, the electricity system was, was horribly dangerous. So, uh, yeah. And then some engineers got together and said, okay, we need to prevent what's preventable. And the whole way that, that safety engineering works is to observe the failures and then work on changing the system so those failures are much less likely to happen, reducing True. risks. Yep. All right. Yeah. Um, more recently, there's been um, security. Mm-hmm. So keeping your, um, your city secure from floods and, and natural disasters, building buildings so they don't collapse and kill everyone in an earthquake. And there's a lot of engineering in that too. And that brings us to sustainability. Of course, uh, we do have to recognize that the security, the natural disaster failures, um, and now cyber failures are what spur the developments to to try and prevent future failures. So in sustainability, I'm looking for, have we already observed the failures, observed the constraints, and has engineering responded to that in any way it can we find any examples of that yeah that's um, a hard question because um, you know the safety engineering um, like uh, fire engineering in buildings you know security you know um, for example uh, the computer security um, that doesn't allow hackers or other people to invade your personal space and belongings on your computer but um, sustainability is another topic that i couldn't quite find out what has been done yet um it's it's hard to think about yeah yeah which is funny because the word sustainability is on everything yeah but what we're looking for here is where there's been a failure um of something that's unsustainable and engineers have changed that so that it's it's not uh, so that it's not happening anymore and like we said we, we see examples in in pollution management and and that sort of thing like a, a changing of um, 
chlorofluorocarbon refrigerants to refrigerants that don't destroy the ozone layer you could say maybe that's a win there put that yeah. in the yeah. in the win column of the engineers yeah. <laughs> and that's maybe it's not a bad example because the scientists were saying this is happening the engineers were like i don't know people want to buy the freon yeah it's a great thing what do you want to do go back to ammonia that's dangerous <laughs> <laughs> and then luckily somewhere some chemical engineer said oh maybe okay it's the chlorine that's doing it so maybe we could make a refrigerant without the chlorine yeah and <laughs> there we are so engineers need to be aware of the science and understand what the problem is and then try to think of how to not do that yeah yeah that's and true. um Belen, can you can you think of another area where uh yeah for sure like the water like yeah everybody needs water and the water is um limited resource and how we deal with water and how the system works like this is a big area where sustainability needs to focus because i'm not really aware about how much have has like people that deal with water like think of sustain sustainability but it's for sure a topic and or an area where they have to work in right and uh, i would say i found a few examples of the inkling of that idea of constraints and changing existing systems to meet those constraints not to grow more not to do more you know, not for the usual reasons that we think of engineers doing things, but to fit within constraints. And that's in the Western U.S., where water is yeah. really scarce. Yeah. Oh, yeah. California, Colorado. California. Nevada. Nevada, yeah. yes. Um, Australia is in the same situation, where they just don't have water. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you see is new engineered um, devices, like low, flush, low water toilets, low water using um, appliances, uh, low flow shower heads, you see an engineering response to that constraint. Yeah. So that uh, I'll put that out there as a little example of um, where the actual constraint on what we can do and the unsustainability of the way we're doing it leads to a change in the system that's using it. And that change is in a downward direction on, on use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. So that leads us to the next question. If sustainability is actually the business of surviving by recognizing what the problems are and what the constraints are, being able to see what we're doing that's unsustainable, and then the engineers who work on that unsustainable system changing things about it, then what are we doing? We're, we've, <laughs> we've been studying energy and my question was, do you think that engineers, say the ones that you've known so far in your class or your professors, do they know about global warming and oil supply and the constraints that these things actually mean for our future and, and for everything we do? So, yeah, from what I've seen, like the engineers I know and yeah, the people I have contact with, like people is like aware of the problem and it's like yeah for sure it's a problem but we are sustainable we work in sustainability we will invest in solar we we are doing great and it's a problem that will be solved itself for sure yeah mm. yeah like sorry like in like Belen you said um you, they are aware of it they know how it works they know how um global warming works um but they are not really aware of the problem so For sure. they know the problem but they have no intention or idea what the constraints will be mm -hmm. um and in the classes you you are told that um we are investing so much and you're told how much energy you get from your renewables how much energy germany for example right now is producing by renewables um that's that's the main focus in the classes i believe um not the other side mm. yeah like what we are told that it's the solution 
actually it's not the solution like yeah right and it's not that hard to figure out that more solar isn't gonna reduce coal yeah yeah i mean <laughs> just or the way that that we're burning oil it and how about the failure mechanisms like climate change is one thing but but that failure mechanism of oil supply um the way that we do everything requires a, a an enormous amount of oil in, in that we use 90 uh, billion barrels million barrels a day yeah. we, we use this enormous amount of oil and if you cut that in half tomorrow we can guarantee failure of every system that we know <laughs> right it, it uh, we have a, a very high risk yeah and so knowing that the future involves less of that oil um, do you, have you ever gotten any sense of what we're doing about that? How we're changing our, changing everything to use less oil? Have you ever had anybody yeah, discuss sure. that? Not in, <laughs> not in the classes. We okay. Get. Well, we're either in totally the wrong track because it's not a, nobody cares, or we're at the leading edge. What do you think? <laughs> We'll go with leading edge. Mm. <laughs> How comfortable is the leading edge while we're at it? Yeah, it's like pretty comfortable. You like it? You like being at the leading edge? Of... Oh, no, no. I mean, it's comfortable to think that, yeah, this is working. Oh, that we've got all the solutions yeah, already. That's, oh, yeah, yes, that's yes. It is, and maybe point. that's why most people want to stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's not comfortable to think about how much we've got to change, especially when you yeah. don't know how to. What is it we're supposed to do? Yeah, yeah. Right? Change is Ooh. never comfortable yeah, for some people. Is scary. Well, change isn't comfortable, and especially when you don't know what it is you got to do. Right, that's really yeah. uncomfortable. Right. All right, and I think it's uncomfortable for everybody, not just engineers. Engineers want to be the good guys, supplying what everybody wants. Mm. But what about everybody else? What about scientists and economists and uh, people in government and media? You know, th there's a lot of people out there. Um, how many of them do you think uh, are talking about um, constraints or sustainable development or you know what well, is it just that engineers aren't looking at it or is it sort of a, a problem of of everybody in society so yeah i think it's a bit of a problem of everybody like everybody with his point of view like it's like i'm doing things great or maybe the way i want to change things is great but that's again not like the solution of the problem <laughs> like yeah right we've talked about flipping the perspective before as a way to explain what it is we're talking about this that you're not seeing the problem you're seeing the problem but you're not seeing the problem yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so maybe maybe that is 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 um it is what we need to talk more about because we've got all these great stories about how how we're going to switch to renewables and and we're going to have all this new technology and the technologies that are piling up around being solutions yeah. to me are getting more bizarre all the time yeah, yeah. that's true like colonizing mars or something <laughs> it, it just gets weirder and weirder every year yeah. like the hyper tubes the Hyperloop. <laughs> hyperloop. That's it. The hyperloop. Yeah. <laughs> that was the solution to what problem? <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. So so okay, but maybe there's some value in in being able to see things differently. Mm hmm. Yeah, of course. So, um, seeing is the way that we talk about sustainable development. I mean, it's not that we're not saying the word sustainable enough. I reckon. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yep. Or having Google images for when you type oh, in sustainable. Oh yeah, yeah. Go Google. We've got computer-generated images of sustainable things. We've yeah. got sustainable brands. We've got green all over everything. Yes. Yeah. So it's not for lack of intention. It's not for. <laughs> we, we do, I think, as a culture, have have the sensibility of that we want to be sustainable and we we have since the 60s and 70s these crises of of fuel and um 
and uh, pollution that happened, and yet here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking. I'm thinking about a story. You guys ready for a story? Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, there was a king, as there often is in a story. <laughs> so there was a king, and he had a pretty good kingdom going. Mm -hmm. right. And part of part of the reason he had a pretty good kingdom going is because he had a system of, of um, finding people who knew the most about the different systems that the kingdom depended on to run. So, so he had uh, the top expert in agriculture running the agriculture department, helping, helping to make sure that, that the right crops were grown in the right way and everything was, was going well. And he had the top expert in um, roads and bridges and walls, making sure that, the, that, that people could come into the city to, um, to do their market day, but then enemies couldn't get in, so they had good yeah. security, yeah. good access, good security. Um, he had the, the top expert in education, running the schools for the, for the kingdom. Um, you can see where it's going, right? He was a pretty good kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, with time, it happens that there was uh, um, an invasive uh, pest species, there was a drought, there were strains on this kingdom, there were problems. Mm -hmm. And those problems were showing up in, um, in crop failures, uh, the, they're, they're, they were having a hard time getting enough wood for fuel from, from around, they were having to bring it in from farther away. Um, their quarries were starting to get too deep to get down there and get, um, uh, get some more stone to build some more walls and some more houses and more roads and more bridges. And um, the population was starting to get pretty tight inside the, inside the city. Mm -hmm. So they were essentially kind of probably experiencing the problems of growth. <laughs> right? yep. And the way they were experiencing that is in things not really working out anymore the way they had before. The prosperity was getting difficult and they're spending a lot to keep things going. So one day the king calls together his, his top advisors. There were seven top advisors for the, for the seven different areas. And he said, look, something's going on. Things aren't working out so good anymore. And, and I want to know why. We'll figure out how to fix it, but I want to know why. Um, so tell me, what do we need to do? What's going on? What's the problem? And uh, each of the advisors, you know, they know their stuff. They know what's going on. Well, um, the, the, the crops just aren't growing the way they used to. And uh, the, the, the woods, uh, the, the forestry expert, well, the, the trees uh, aren't mature and we're having to go farther to get trees to use. It's just not, not going the way it used to. And they're all telling him the problem. Yeah. And he kind of already knows the problem. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 I, I want to know what's going on. Like, uh, I get the problem, but what's going on? Yeah. And uh, they all, yeah, okay, well, um, uh, we're having a hard time fitting all the people into the city and the prices are going up and people are having a hard time because they're having to spend a Yeah, 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 I know the problem. And they go through this for, for quite a while, actually. And the king can't, can't make himself understood. I, okay, look, I know you all know your area. You're the expert. You're the top expert. And I know you all can tell me the problem. But I want to know what's the problem. What's going on? <laughs> and he's getting so frustrated. And it was getting close to lunchtime. And he was getting low belly trigger. And he was like, oh, God, call in the guards. Yeah. And the advisors look up, what? Guards, take these men away. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And put a blindfold on them. Oh, my gosh, you know what that means. They're going to be mm. executed. Mm. Yeah. Oh, no. So they're really worried. Please, please, Your Majesty, we'll try harder. We'll, we'll take more data. Mm. We'll, um, we, we'll, we'll plant more. We'll, we'll bring more trees. We'll, we'll <sighs> take them down the hall. So the guards march the wise men off, put the blindfolds on them, and put them into a room. All right, he says, the king says, you're my wisest advisors. You're supposedly the wisest men in, in the kingdom. You are in a room with something, and I want you to tell me what it is. Yeah. And you have until I'm finished with my lunch <laughs> to tell me what is in the room with you. And by the time that my servant girl brings my water 
to finish up my lunch. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'll ask her. And if she knows, you guys are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no problem. We're, we're the wise men. We, you know, we can figure out what's in the room with us. Um, sure. Okay, go. King sits down to have his lunch. And the first wise man, he reaches out with his hands and he feels, he feels a, something really hard and sharp. And, oh my, that's, that's like a spear. I'm sure that's what it is. It's a spear. And the next one reaches out and he feels something really round and solid. Oh, well, you're nuts. That's a, that's a tree. Oh, what mm. you, you know, I'm a forester expert. I know a tree when I feel one. Yeah. And another one reaches out. Oh, heavens, no. That, that, this is a, it's a sail. It's a canvas like, like you have in the market to, to, to cover the stalls. What are you talking about? A spear and a tree. And another one says, oh, my goodness, no. This is a wall. I know a nice, smooth wall when I feel one. It's <laughs> solid. You push on it. <laughs> And another one says, what are you, nuts? It's a rope. I can feel the frayed end. Mm, mm. And, they, and the king's waiting. They're arguing. They're arguing a lot. I can feel it. It's a rope. It's long and it has a frayed end. No, I, how do you feel a frayed end? I'm feeling it's, it's hard and solid and sharp. It's a weapon, clearly. It's a new kind of weapon. And okay. Okay. That's uh, lunch is over. Yeah, they didn't get it out. The serving girl comes in, and the king says, All right, tell me, what is in the room with you? And uh, they are silent for a moment, and then they all start arguing at the same time, mm. trying to shout each other down, because they want to tell him, because they don't want to be killed. It's getting louder and louder and louder. Finally, stop. <laughs> Servant girl, tell me what is in the room. And she says, well... It's an elephant, sir. <laughs> really? It's not hard to see. <laughs> oh, no, please, Your Majesty, please. That, 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 stop. How can my simple serving girl tell what's in the room and you can't? Well, we were blindfolded. We, how could we see what's in the room if we're blindfolded? Mm. And the king says, yes, you were blindfolded. So what could you have done? Oh, well, if he'd have listened to me, and if, if they'd have listened, maybe we could have... But we were blindfolded. Okay, did I ever tell you you couldn't take off your blindfolds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's mm. hard. Mm. I don't think he actually beheaded them all, but... <laughs> <laughs> but the moral of the story is that if, if you can do something to change your perspective... And it is a dire situation and, and there's problems and we need to see what is the, what's behind the problems and yeah. not just talk about the problems. Yeah. Can we metaphorically take off our blindfolds, people from different expertise and with different, different backgrounds and really ask ourselves, what is going on? What is the problem? Yeah. Yeah, that might be a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> might be a good plan for some, yeah. That's true. For sure. Now, having a story like that, yeah. do you think it would be helpful for people who, who normally are in that position of having their own expertise, having their own um, understanding, and who do a lot of talking about the, the problem... Um, do you think it would help them to maybe go through an exercise of changing their perspective and being open to, to seeing things in different ways? I, I hope so, because that's why I've put together the little story and, and use it. It obviously will help people that are so uh, in their tunnel of explaining things and seeing only the problem and only a specific problem of things. And I think they they just focus too much on it and maybe or I think it will help to do a little exercise and try to put the blindfolds on or maybe uh, flip the perspective and see in the problem you're talking about all day, all week um, in another perspective, right. right? So what about you guys? Uh, does it seem now really that confusing to see the problem on both sides i mean <clears throat> do you remember did, did did you see that before and and it 
I mean, for myself, I do have to say, I don't, I don't find it that hard to look at the problem from both sides now. Yeah, no. Yeah, for sure. It helped a lot, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, when I came here, I, I thought I had some solutions, but... For sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like now you can see from... Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. But switching the perspective a little makes it clear that maybe a solution isn't really the solution so yeah. you think the solution well uh, uh, people are really wedded to the things that they they think are the solutions right and you, that's something we don't want to forget either yeah right you're mm -hmm. pretty impressed when you hear about a new technology and um you're into it right, right? well and, and and the people working on on all these things are not evil they're not trying <laughs> yeah. to do evil things right they're trying to do the good thing yeah. yeah so here's one thing i say about uh seeing things from the other side is that look um there probably are enough people working on that yeah we need some people to take this journey of taking the blindfolds off and seeing what else we can find Right. Mm. Because we need everything we can get. Right. That's right. true. Yeah. That's what transition engineering is about. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And we I definitely <laughs> need engineers to be amongst that group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do need. All right. Well, there we are. I think we've got to the end of our podcast. Um, good wrap up there. Um, and I, I really do hope that uh, people will take a look for, for GATE, for the Global Association of Transition Engineers, and, and have a think. Um, we can help with seeing those new perspectives and finding new solutions um, to the problems that you know very well. Hmm. Um, but it, it's a matter of, of going and looking. Yeah. Yeah. Going after it. That's true. Sure. All right, and I wish you guys good luck in your um, in your studies and your exams and um, finding a job. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, um, that brings us to probably an important point. What is the job market for transition engineers? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> I know, no. because nobody knows what that is. Yeah, that's true. It might be at this point that it's an entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as it starts to show real results for real companies and real communities and real organizations, then it's going to start to be quite in demand. Yeah. That's what I feel. Yeah, let's hope. Ho hopefully. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks for joining us. And uh, like mm. I said, good luck to you guys. It was great. Uh, Thank you. Having you along for Thank the semester. You. Well, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was great. It was a, a good journey. <laughs> 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 All right, talk to you later. Bye. See you. Bye.